working at all. Yeah, how about that? Uh, all right. How about now? Yeah, now we have now we have some audio. So how, so how um, uh, uh, say all hi. of that again, Corey, if you would. <laughs> you know, it's probably better that nobody heard it. So yeah. hi everyone, welcome for a third time to uh, <laughs> Experiment Seven's The Laboratory, our uh, weekly live stream. You know, this is our second episode, so uh, we're seasoned veterans at this. Uh, we don't ever. Put the wrong setting on the microphone. No uh, my name is Corey Seifert. I'm the director of production here at Experiment 7. Uh, with me, I've got Dimitri, Dimitri Dessarides. How did you do that? Dimitri Dessarides. You screwed it up twice in a row. I okay, had all the chances in the world. No, the first time I got it right, remember? That was last week. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so we have a great show today. A uh, bunch of cool stuff uh, lined up. We are being awesomely hosted by the fine folks at Wizards of the Coast. Thanks to those guys, uh, specifically on their on their D and D stream. Uh, so uh, you know, we're really excited. We have a couple really interesting things to go over with Dungeon Chess. We're going to talk a little bit about Dungeons and Dragons. We have uh, uh, a friend from from Watsi joining us. Uh, so that's great. So let's uh, bring in our our fantastic uh, guests for the day from. Uh, the, the coast of wizards himself, oh. Greg Tito. Greg, how's it going, man? Good. How are you guys doing? Uh, thanks for having me on. This is going to be fun. We got Nathan Stewart kind of lurking in the background. Hey, yeah. what's up? Yes. <laughs> hey, Nathan. How's there it going, brother? <laughs> this is, this is profe- that is professional lurking. That was that good. That is sort of wandered exactly. onto the set. That was excellent. <laughs> uh, and as always, we've got uh, uh, Jeffrey Zatkin, uh, uh, in our, our San Diego office. Even though it says New York City. Yep, that Even was a reference just instead of a clone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, by episode three, we'll have all the kinks worked out. Yeah. Uh, so, so the game we're here to talk about today, uh, uh, obviously, is Dungeon Chess. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a chess game with a little bit of D&D sprinkled on it. Um, why don't we kick or things off? Or a D&D off? game with a whole lot of chess. There you go. <laughs> what, sitting underneath it? I don't know. Anyway. So why don't we, why don't we kick it off with, uh, you know... Dimitri, Jeff, uh, why don't you guys give us a quick overview of what's Dungeon Chess and uh, what's it all about? Awesome. Hey, D, you want to kick in first or should hey, I? Why don't you start? I started too many times last time. You started too many times last time. By the way, hey, Greg, at least you're on the same coast. Yeah, go left coast, best coast. Yeah, <laughs> but he's at the top because you got the Seattle, I got the San Diego. So, you know, we got, <laughs> right. actually, we got Dimitri and Corey over in like New York. So we need a Florida and we're like, We'll have a full square going on. I like that. That's good stuff. Okay, next episode. We got a plan. <laughs> we'll get uh, uh, Hydro 74. I think he's in Miami, so that might work. Wait, did, did you just open a Florida office, Jeff? Is that what just... <laughs> I, I, <laughs> do I get to vote on that? Moving on. But you, you hadn't heard yet? <laughs> All right, Dungeon Chess, boys. Give us the elevator pitch. Okay. So Dungeon Chess, Dimitri and I and just a whole bunch of us over at E7, you know, we've been playing board games for friggin' ever. And we've been playing D&D for friggin' ever. And we have a VR company that's focused on making basically really cool rooms and good experiences that you can come play with your friends, you know, from anywhere in the world. You know, Dimitri's in New York, I'm here, you know, Greg's traveling over to Tokyo. We hop in, we play games together on tables. And one of the very first games we were, you know, basically as we were testing our technologies, hey, let's go make chess. And as we were making that, we were like, man, we remember Battle Chess and Archon and Harry Potter Chess and, you know, the Star Wars animated, you know, all of these kind of cool pop culture things. And we're like, it'd be really cool to do one of those kind of things again. And so as we were doing this, we'd been, you know, Corey had been chatting with John over at WotC and knew that they were kind of starting to look around for some extra stuff to be doing. And we're like, wouldn't it be cool if we, you know, we did like a throwback to kind of Battle Chess and Archon and some of the others, but with a modern twist. And if we went over to the WotC guys and said, hey, could we make this official D&D? And, um... I could tell the story about how we crashed their GDC pitch process and everything, but I'll save that for another time. But we pitched them and we're like, yeah, how about this animated fighting Dungeons and Dragons, you know, monsters on a chessboard? And they were like, that sounds pretty cool. (laughs) Well, one of the things that actually that Nathan, um, who just who just bombed in and like strongman the background. Uh, which was awesome. Um, one of the things that, that he said actually in, a, in, in an interview um, in an article uh, a few months ago, um, they, they were talking about, well, you know, D&D, there's a D&D clicker game. There's, you know, there's a D&D VR chess game. Like, are we seeing D&D kind of stretch its wings as a pop culture brand? Is this brand? the D&D final form? Yeah, well... Right. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I like no, stretch his stretches wings. Yeah, <laughs> latte mugs for everybody with D and D. I think yeah. that's the ultimate. 
Um, so Greg, I mean, I don't know, what did you, can you, can you unravel that a little bit? Like, is D and D becoming a more of a, of a pop culture brand as well? I, I think so. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons is, is uh, uh, got amazing uh, penetration <laughs> into the amount of, uh, you know, uh, people just know that brand, you know, whether it's from Stranger Things or, you know, from when they played 40 years ago to, you know, to uh, uh, they're all in a group now, you know. So uh, I think the, the, the penetration of the brand going into different areas and, and different forms of gaming uh, is, is, is right and good. And I, we're seeing more and more folks uh, who want to play, uh, you know, something that's may not be uh you know the uh, the genre of you know traditional tabletop role playing games but they still want to experience what happens with Dungeons and Dragons those characters that idea that you know you're telling a story with your friends you know even if it's a single player experience it feels you know like you're still participating in what makes Dungeons and Dragons cool so yeah we're seeing that across the board and uh, uh, I think Dungeon Trust is a great example of that where it's you know, it's a chess game. It's, the mechanics are all the very same, but we all have those fond memories of um, of, of battle chess. I remember I used to, you know, make sure I could see every single animation by making sure, you know, the... And, the... and lose badly. <laughs> yes, many, many times, you know, but having a pawn be able to capture the queen uh, uh, to... to get the checkmate was always was always a fun goal to get to uh so having that happen with uh with vr and and in with dungeons and dragons and monsters is is just perfect i don't know i love it yeah one yeah. of the things that that um that i i kind of always felt about D D that it, it's it's finally starting to happen is like you know as someone who grew up like just soaking in this universe and 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 you know reading the the monster manual in the back of the car everywhere I went for, you know, for years like that, you just never want to come out of it. And, and at the yeah. time you kind of had to, because unless you had a group together or you had the books with you, like <laughs> you weren't really playing D&D. &D. And then when, um, uh, and then when computer games started to show up that, you know, the gold box games and the, and the SSI games and, and stuff in that era, like you finally got to the, the tendrils finally got out a little bit and you, and you got to, you know, do have your have be in the D and D world um, uh, in you know while you were doing something else. And I mean, it's just it's an odd thing about fandom, but I think it's it's something that's just super enduring. I mean, I remember when I read the Harry Potter books, the the only thing that I could find that was a Harry Potter branded thing was like a a box of Harry Potter Legos. And I went, mm. I bought a box of Legos. I don't have anything to do with a box of Legos. I don't have any children. I don't even really know how to put Legos together. But I just wanted to like soak in Harry Potter for another couple of minutes. And uh, and so that that it's like that's the power of of something like Dungeons and Dragons. And and I'm really happy that we we got to start off our our D and D experience by uh, by giving somebody yet another vector to access the stuff they love yeah so that's hey, that's hey. a great segue so if we if we go back to sort of the beginning of, of dungeon chess mm -hmm. actually wait wait I, I gotta interrupt you Corey, for one thing greg just so you know my wife and i just finished up stranger things uh two nights ago on halloween that's nice. and um while they we were doing that we took like you know, <laughs> a quick stream. break at the end of episode uh eight the mind flayer and i went out and i pulled my first edition monster manual off the shelf and like opened it up to show her, you know, the, right. player, the same one they just used in the show. And she was like, okay, that's, you know. That's powerful. That's powerful. And I was completely like, yeah, I still got it. I know. <laughs> I wanted them to go into the elder brain and all the stuff that we did for Volo's Guide to Monsters and all that. But, nice. you know, it's close. It's, it, was, it was pretty <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so, uh, so here's my question to you guys. Um, you know, this is this is sort of to, to Jeff and Dimitri, but but Greg, this is also to you uh, in a broader sense. You know, you know, for for dungeon chess, mm -hmm. we could have taken any any brand and, and, and thrown it on and mm -hmm. made a chess game, right, Greg? You could have worked yeah. anywhere. Um, why Dungeons and Dragons? Oh, Greg, why don't you start that? Like, why why did you? How did you wind up there? And uh, and then we can talk about why our game is there. How did I end up uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons or no, working for Dungeons and Dragons? Working at Wizards. Oh, that's a crazy long story. Uh, and uh, it's one of those, you know, because we do get that a lot. You're like, oh, how did you get, you know, to work in the game industry? Not even just at Dungeons and Dragons, but like, how did you get into it? And it, uh, it was happenstance more than anything else. I was a, 
uh, theater nerd. Uh, I, I was went to college for theater. Uh, met my wife. She was an actress. I was a stage manager, and uh, uh, I know, but I did. I got to, and it was amazing. Um, <laughs> And she actually called me from uh, uh, from Bobby Moynihan's dorm room uh, from four floors up. She was like, hey, come on, hang out with us. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. Uh, the guy who used to be on SNL and is now uh, uh, in an ABC sitcom, uh, you know, went on to Did do to crazy, crazy. college? <laughs> UConn? Did you go to UConn? No, no. Uh, I, 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 sorry, I, I, I couldn't remember whether he went. I went to NYU. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and Tish. Uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a niece who went there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was doing theater. I was in New York City. I was uh, uh, producing small theater um, as much as I could. Uh, well, while, of course, having a day job. My, my day job for a while was theater. I was doing stage management. Um, but through it all, I was always playing games. And uh, I eventually married uh, my, my girlfriend and then now wife. And uh, I realized uh, that I, I came up from a Catholic background. And so I was like you, uh, Jeffrey, and that I was fascinated with the Monster Manual and, and, and all those books. Uh, and uh, there was a point in the 80s where my mom uh, was like, you know what, you shouldn't be playing that or looking at that or even having those books. So they went away. Um, and uh, I was living in New York. I was married. I, you know, had, had a, I was an adult by all measures, right? And I was like, you know, nothing's stopping me from playing Dungeons and Dragons anymore. <laughs> I'm a big kid now. <laughs> I'm a big kid, right? Uh, You're so allowed. I found a group. Uh, we played through the Age of Worms uh, campaign, and uh, I just lucked into having uh, a group that was not only uh, you know great role players, but uh, really productive and creative on their own. Uh, so uh, they started uh, writing for. Uh, at the time, it was fourth edition was just about to come out, uh, mm -hmm. so they were working on on those products, and I was like, oh, I, I might think about doing that. And I started writing some of that stuff. Uh, well, at the same time, following uh, you know on the web, uh, Penny Arc. Arcade, uh, uh, the web comic from from here in Seattle mentioned that they were in a uh, small publication called The Escapist, which was a PDF that was sent out to um, you know game developers and people used to print it out and keep it. It was like kind of like a magazine quality um, with uh, images and layout. Uh, and I was like, oh, that seems like a cool thing. I'll just pitch something to them about you know World of Warcraft or uh, I think it was actually Alpha Centauri. Um, and they accepted the pitch randomly, and it was the, one of the first times I got. Uh, paid for writing uh, and then that relationship continued and I continued pitching more and more articles eventually they were looking for a full-time editor so I moved down to uh, North Carolina to work for them full-time um, and I was always I always had tabletop kind of in mind even though I was it was mostly a video game based thing so I tried to pitch them hey we should write about more we should write about more Dungeons and Dragons more Dungeons and Dragons um, and then when uh, I you know I worked my way up through uh, the escapist and eventually uh, got laid off like like happens yeah. that's <laughs> uh, that is kind of the next step yeah. after boss <laughs> it's laid off. Yeah, so editor in chief and then laid off. Um, there's more to that story. I don't want to go into it now. But then eventually, uh, it was the perfect timing because uh, Dungeons and Dragons was looking for uh, uh, someone to lead the communication charge, and uh, I connected through. Uh, uh, it was actually a guy who works at Telltale, Joe Stuff Sofer. Um, it hooked me up with Nathan, and uh, the rest is history. I've been here for about two and a half years, uh, just talking about how awesome Dungeons and Dragons is, which is what I was trying to do with all my articles <laughs> at the Escapist going forward. So yeah, which in the games industry is about 42 years so yeah congratulations on your 42 year anniversary i believe that was yesterday <laughs> nice that's the fun thing is is like even though you know i've been here a long time there are people who are at watsi and on dungeons and dragons who've been here for 20 years yeah. 25 years you know which is which is crazy in a, the gaming industry as you guys know it's yeah. just you know you oh, don't yeah. People don't stay uh, uh, at the same company, but the, b people do and here. The, and the company doesn't stay like around. <laughs> it's you true. Know? I mean, the, there's that. But that's but that kind of goes to what we were talking about before with that like super deep love of the of the property where you you know it, it you know it, we I used to work at DC Comics and we had a similar kind of a vibe there. Everybody was you know you were either there for like ten minutes um, or you were there for thirty five years. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, you're and you're right. It speaks to the power of, of the brand people here or working on it are super passionate and just want to continue to make it grow and evolve with uh, with the players and everything that's happening. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's been a whirlwind, and uh, we love it here. And then I get to work with fine folks like you uh, on a on a on a you know I don't want to say daily basis, but at least a weekly basis. <laughs> yes. And uh, you know we've got more and more stuff that we're working on for the future too. I know you and I, Dimitri, are talking about uh, uh, the future plans of things happening in in New York City. So yeah, I hope in fact, I, I want to, uh, we should get 
on the phone after this because I have an update for you and it's good. Ooh, nice. Okay, cool. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Like We're good updates. All right, producer Corey is getting nervous, so let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> what, you don't want to talk about secrets on a live mic? It's <laughs> oh, God, Speaking of which, hey, producer Corey, why does my thingy say New York instead of San Diego? We talked about it. It's, it's, reference, a, it's very it's technical. problem it's, exists between keyboard and chair Mostly, over here. yeah. It's <laughs> no, not enough coffee. So, Dimitri, yeah. uh, why don't you give us, you know, uh, what's your story? Like, what was the one thing with D&D that made you just fall in love with it? Give, give, me, give us, like, a great, your great D&D back in the in the day oh man i mean there's something about there's something about dungeons and dragons in you know like 1979 um that was a that was about being a big kid you know <laughs> that was like the yeah. thing that your friend's older brother did and and in my case it was literally the thing that that my friend's older brother was <laughs> was doing and uh you know it was like you could borrow jason's books for a little while and uh and then you know and 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 run this like totally you know like random like we just roll a bunch of dice and say we're playing dungeons and dragons uh D, D campaign but the great thing about D, D is that it 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 actually managed through the setting and and um and the the sort of robustness of the game to support both total goofing around and um, an actual serious approach to the game. So you, the older you get, the, yeah. the you know you you don't have to like go away, right? It's not like you know playing kickball. Like they pretty much make you stop after after you're like ten. Well, unless you're a hipster in Brooklyn. Yes. And then you play here <laughs> forever. Yeah. Uh, that's when yeah. I started playing when I was a hipster in Brooklyn. That's <laughs> so <laughs> it, it makes sense. That that tracks. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so, so Jeff, what do you think? Give, give us your what's your what's your like origin story for D and D. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think because I've been I had the the red book, the basic edition set from when it first came out. I actually still have the dice, you know, the the blue plastic dice that came with it. I was looking at my dice collection the other day. Oh man, I should dig up that. Actually, Greg, here's one for you. So about half. A year ago, as we were like chatting with you guys about some stuff, somebody made a dice comment, and I'd like I'd collected all my dice recently, and I looked at them, and I realized I'd had some of these dice for like, so I'm in my mid 40s. I'd had some of them for almost 35 to 40 years. That's amazing. I was like, I don't think I've ever cleaned my dice, and I know some of these have been to like conventions and rolled across sticky floors. <laughs> so I took all my dice and I put them in this big bowl and like soapy water and washed them all off and. My wife came in again, looked like, what are you doing? I'm like, actually, you don't want to know on this one. But I have this picture I posted on Instagram. It's just this huge bowl of dice, like a little bit of soapy water. And afterwards, I was like, I have no idea if anybody else has ever cleaned their dice. But I mean, I've been <laughs> you, playing You should have gotten space. an official Wizards of the Coast dice washer. I'm definitely doing that tonight. <laughs> I, I oh. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> totally, totally opportunities for branding there. Yeah, man. There I'm, I'm always thinking. But yeah, you know, I mean. <laughs> Basic edition, and it's funny, there was actually, you, I don't know if anybody here has ever seen it, there was a D&D &D coloring book that okay. came out sometime oh, yeah. in the late 70s, like oh. 79 Yeah, they had it at Gen Con there's in the museum that, section. There's one that for just came out like a year ago, like 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 coloring books oh, are yeah, like yeah, cool yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. it's like but the, this like, was cool a coloring book for kids. Oh no, this is yeah. adult color. Well, actually, it was oh, kind of for kids. It. It, was like <laughs> it was kind of for adults too, but I remember doing that and playing basic. And I mean, I had a group of friends that I played with. Like I was we had a rotating DM. Ooh. Hey Greg, <laughs> send me one of those. <laughs> yeah, I will. We, we have one We're in a couple actually. second I, delay for anybody watching. One. So when I see Greg hold it up, I get to see it like six seconds later yeah. in real life. And then we laugh a couple seconds yeah. after that. Mm -hmm. But um yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had a group of friends I played with from, like, elementary school, junior high, high school, you know, rotating GMs, and actually, something kind of cool. So I was on the original design team of EverQuest a really long time ago, wow. um, and one of the things that we were talking about for EverQuest, I mean, part of our whole thought was we all loved playing MUDs and D&D, but we could never get all our D&D friends kind of back together because everybody, like, scattered to the winds, you know, was in different places, so one of the whole thoughts behind making, you know, one of the first big fantasy MMOs was, hey, we could get our friends together from anywhere, you know, instead of like once a week when they can travel in to, you know, play at somebody's house on Friday, we could play every single night. And that was kind of some of the thought behind 
you know, making some of those things. So, I mean, yeah, I've been really? playing forever, and, you know, it's kind of helped follow along both from my, you know, programming BBS games, programming MUDs, programming the first MM, you know, designing some of the first MMOs, because I'm actually a lousy programmer. You'd never want to hire me to be a programmer. I'm a much better Noted. designer. But, Noted. I mean, that's it's a, just that, it's that's part something of our I, I, I often say, too. It's like a lot of people who have engineering somewhere in their background, but it doesn't feature prominently. Like if if my name is on the credits under engineering or programming, your game yeah, was something went wrong. Something went <laughs> so, I uh, that's funny too because Magic: The Gathering was ostensibly you know designed for uh, you know stuff to play when you couldn't get your D and D group together or when there true. was a break <laughs> or downtime. You know that's the, kind of the the urban legend about it, and, uh, and I, I'm sure there's people here actually who know yeah, whether or not that's true. Uh, but that's yeah, what I'm careful concerned. saying that. In that yeah, office, I say, that's... <laughs> I'm pretty sure you have access to Richard Garfield if you really want. <laughs> Come over here, Rich, and he's like, "Hello, here I am." <laughs> that is true. Goodbye. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, uh, but no, yeah, that's I didn't realize that about EverQuest. That's pretty amazing, uh, cool. and uh, I'm going to use that in all of my uh, my PR communications going forward. <laughs> Feel free. I mean, it. Well, actually, one of my absolute proudest moments, Greg, was you know we were so influenced by D and D, and as we were making EQ, I think it was third edition was kind of um, coming, or after it come, we'd fit, published EQ, third yeah. edition D and D was coming out, Someone and I know because we that. went over, we got a tour of uh, Wizards at that time that there were a whole bunch of Watsi people playing EQ. And I got to see, you know, we were so influenced, obviously. You know, you can't make a fantasy RPG and not be influenced by D&D. Yeah. But seeing tiny bits of, like, some of the stuff we didn't thought of kind of get referenced by them in third edition, like, you know, Bards, for example. Definitely have some reference of EverQuest going into that. But Absolutely. it's just this whole cycle of development of, you know, people make cool stuff, then we make cool stuff, then other people do it. Everybody, you know, influences it together to kind of push all of this forward and do you know awesome new things it's true it's true that's i mean that's you know every creative industry to a certain extent but the gaming industry you can really trace oh, yeah. those those uh, tendrils of inspiration and how they each build on the next and you know some some companies are experts at taking exactly what works out of things and making them better um you know and uh, uh dungeons and dragons has been doing that as well and uh yeah that, you're right yeah, it's funny. Exactly. When when I was a kid, I used to imagine that all like when I was a really little kid, I used to imagine that all of the companies like TSR back in the day and and DC and Marvel, like they all had like their own building, and all the people that were in the building worked for that company, and then they all like hated the oh. other ones, right? Like like the DC <laughs> people like hate the Marvel people, <laughs> and they would you know if they saw each other they'd get into fights. Like I'm four at this point, so. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Very much Jets and Sharks. So, um, so yeah, when I went out, when I wound up working at, at DC years later, like they are the same people. How do you think you get a promotion in the comic book industry? There's only two big companies. You just, yeah, you just go back and forth. Uh, we, we all used to go out for drinks with each other like every couple of days. Um, so anyway, yeah. You know, back to your question list. It was good, and now we're blowing it all up. Yeah. Oh, no, this, this is great. I mean, like, <laughs> I, so I have like an agenda item here. It's like nerd out about D and D because I figured, you know, that's why we're all here. Right? <laughs> we're doing it. We're yeah. doing it. Uh, yeah. But no, I mean, we just had Jim Zub uh, in the office uh, recently too, and he's been working for uh, it feels like every comic book company. Uh, and you're right, there there is not that you know that uh, uh, rivalry per se. It's more about uh, uh, people working together, and it's a small enough industry that like, oh, you can work for this, work for this, and then once you see that, you know, you get working on, and you know, the tabletop gaming industry is is similar in that way. You know, people trade back and forth uh, between uh, you know the major publishers as well as we're building up folks with the Dungeon Masters Guild uh, and getting more and more, uh, you know, uh, guidance to the next generation of RPG designers that will come in and make it happen. So, yeah, no, it's I see a lot of correlation between those two. There's um, a great comment in the chat uh, from Elwarius. Uh, D&D wasn't my first RPG, but it's my favorite because it is the sweet spot between iconic lore, storytelling, interesting mechanics, and advancement. I, I couldn't say it better myself. Mm -hmm. Like, it it scratches all those itches, right? Like, there's a bunch of, like, video games and board games and RPGs that have, like, you know, great progression or great tactical gameplay. But D&D, &D, it's like, it brings it all together. So I, I just want to highlight that one. I think that was a... That was a good one. Um, yeah. It's true. And I, what I like yeah. about it, too, is that it hits 
different things for different people. Yeah. Like some people really like the tactical type of play, and some people really like uh, optimizing their characters or, or or having you know weird and strange characters that they like are not optimized that like they like to play. And then some people like the the, the story and the drama that kind of evolve over years of play. And some people like one shots, and some people like you know maps and really making maps. You know, it's one of those things that like you know it appeals to different people, and it's such a creative. Um, uh, smorgasbord, really. Yeah. I mean, like it's like you know, I think a, that's a actually cathedral, and it needs so many different hobby, disciplines, as opposed to just a game, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of yeah, the one of the things that that kind of came up while we were working on Dungeon Chess um, was that you know one of the opportunities that that we got there was was to spend some time like working with these monsters that you know that that um, we had kind of grown up thinking about and stuff and 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 trying to like put our own um uh, put a little bit of a fingerprint on that on that lore like what does a beholder sound like is so, uh... this is a perfect segue i'd like you to keep talking but i'm gonna bring up a little bit of the concept art that we worked on uh, oh nice uh, good idea for for dungeon chess so please hey Corey, yeah. since we're on a delay can you tell me what's coming up as you uh post so that's, each a, one? that's a picture of the beholder and then it's it's gone into the um uh, uh, oh my God, I can't remember the Deva. name. Uh, the Deva, yeah, exactly. Well, you know what? Yeah. It's gonna go too fast. It's a, it's like a, a shuffle rotator. Yeah. So why don't we just sort of chat? I think the 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 cool thing that you were saying, and this is one of the things that I I really loved about the character development and the room development was. Mm -hmm. you know, put oh yeah, 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 exactly. And and I told this story before, so so stop me if you've heard this one. Um, but uh, I've heard it. I've heard it. Stop. <laughs> yeah. I was <just> kidding. <laughs> but like the when when um yeah when we were uh. When Jeff was looking at the 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 room that you know we had decided, okay, you know, obviously this has to take place in an iconic location, and as as you can see in the, the background of of the of this chat, it was uh, the yawning portal is where we wound up, and with that awesome giant mouth fireplace, and and so we we went back to find reference on the yawning portal, and the and uh, you guys uh, kindly uh, gave us a bunch of reference, but there was never an actual authoritative floor plan of what the yawning portal looked like. And, uh, and so when we asked about it, um, you, you know, you guys like, were like, yeah, you know, that doesn't really exist. We'll have somebody make it. So then we got this awesome floor plan back, uh, but the, the way that the floor plan originally was laid out didn't have a big enough space for us to put the table in um so uh so i think jeff was the guy who was like yeah i was said, photoshopping yeah you actually <laughs> sent back a, a gif that was like could this wall be over here and there's like a couple of arrows and and uh and then they changed it so now the actual yawning portal um in in actual Faerun, because this is how i live um uh has uh has some kind of impact from dungeon chess in it and mm -hmm. like even that little Little tiny sliver of uh, of impact is is a pretty cool thing yeah, for I, for people who grew up doing this. I think you've got like sixty years of game development or something on this call, and I don't know about you guys, but like I've only ever influenced the universe of Dungeons and Dragons once. Like <laughs> that was super cool. Yeah, yeah that is yeah. cool. I mean, yeah, it was specifically you know one of the things you know since we've been doing a whole bunch of VR games. We've learned, you know, what does feel good in an environment? How much space do you need around you, you know, for a table and chairs? And it was literally, as I was looking over the floor plans, I'm like, okay, this corner room would be the perfect location. You can look out, you know, and see the floor of the awning portal from your little private, you know, like corner room. But man, we need a couple extra feet. So it, it was literally me taking the floor plan into Photoshop and like doing a little bit of that, you know, editing the map, because I used to draw a lot of maps too, <laughs> you know, and sending it back and you know we're like i hope they accept it and yeah i'm sure you guys were like yeah whatever yeah. you know it's no, not a big they, deal they thought about yeah, it right. for a whole week that there was a, a yeah there was a series of meetings they convened yeah. the it. council of Faerun floor planning <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we got the wizards three on the phone yeah. we got uh you know, morden kane yeah. elminster it occurs to me that when I when we work with you guys, Greg, I never think of you guys as like a dude wearing like a t-shirt and a hoodie. I mm -hmm. kind of always think of you guys as like dwarves and elves in a castle, <laughs> like subconsciously <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> right. Which uh, makes sense uh, to some degree. I mean, you know, we're always in costume, always uh, making loud I proclamations of you shall not pass. And, well, uh, John at least is always in costume. Yes. I can attest to that. We, um... <laughs> 
we actually have on Slack a little John rolling his eyes icon uh, that uh, that you can put up when um, when like Jeff makes a really bad pun uh, or uh, or something like that. So, In Slack, um, yeah. uh, custom icons for the win. Uh, one of the things that Jeff, you were just saying that kind of reminded me of of another part of the dungeon chess process was because we had already done one VR game and because we, we were, you know, there are people on our staff who have worked on VR for years. There was um, there was a lot of like taking extra care because this was one of the first times that D and D stuff had showed up in in VR. Um, on top of just us being, you know, tremendous D and D nerds and wanting to get everything right, there's this sense of like, okay, you know, if this, like, how high off of the ground does a beholder float if a beholder was was constrained in a chessboard pattern? Like, <laughs> all of all of the overthinking that you would think that a bunch of people who are huge into D and D would do actually. Oh, happened. we did. Uh, good. Good. Actually, Corey, that reminds me. Can you bring up the um, gold dragon picture? Uh, yeah, I can. The, the screen will go black, but you know what, Jeff? Why don't you talk a little bit of, while I'm doing that um, about that process? Because like we did spend a lot yeah. of uh, ink arguing about <laughs> like, no, that's not the challenge rating of that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So one of the things that we tried to do is as we were lining up chess pieces, make sure that the challenge rating of you know the monster corresponded with basically the power of the um, actual piece itself. And um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure, you know, the kings and queens, the most powerful pieces, you know, fire, you know, fire giant, red dragon, storm giant, gold dragon. You're right, Corey, the screen definitely did go black. Hopefully something will come on. Yep, we, we got it. We got it. Okay, cool. He's pushing but, um, Magic is happening. There we go. Excellent. D, &D so, is happening. Not magic. One one of my favorite actual pieces is the gold dragon that we're seeing on the screen right now, and the reason for this is all of the pieces are they're not perfectly to scale against each other, but they're pretty close. You know, the giant is considerably bigger than like the elf pawn, and you know we picked we picked this very intentionally, but um, the guy, our art director um, Jason, on this one was trying to figure out, and we were working back and forth. How do you fit a dragon into a square without, you know, so that it, but it doesn't clip through everything next to it and we don't have to make it tiny. And after a whole bunch of work, one day he was sitting, you know, I got this in my inbox and he's like, what do you think about this? You know, what if we had the dragon like sitting on its haunches, wings up and its tail wrapped around itself. And when you select it, it like launches itself up into the air. So it's, you know, flying above the board and then it, you know, its tail goes out, its wings go out, and, you know, it's still full size, but he kind of figured out how to wrap a dragon into something you could actually fit into a chess square while still letting it remain, you know, big. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just one of those ones that you never really think about. So you're like, how do you fit a dragon in a chess square without making it tiny? Right. So right. this is kind of one of my happiest pieces just from a design perspective mm -hmm. because we managed to get a large-scale dragon in and it was just, you know, right. it was kind of cool. It reminds me of one of my favorite uh, uh, minis. So you guys, you know, when you do uh, uh, DLC for for new monsters, uh, yeah. this one is the the rock uh, mm -hmm. that fits it fits on a large uh, uh, scale. Uh, but it's you know, rocks are much bigger than this, obviously. But this is in the middle of of you know how it could look if you're using it. I'm sure the miniatures builders at this time had the same problem, where it was like, how do we make this? Because the wingspan <laughs> itself will like you know knock over everything else. But here it is, you know, and it's got a rider on it as well, which makes it uh, doubly cool. Um, Ooh, but uh, exactly. I love, yeah, I just love that it's you know uh, using that three dimensional space in a way that's uh, interesting and new. And you guys have to deal with that uh, in a digital game, you know, more so than than others have to. Because of the the constraints and stuff like that, and that's you know I think that's another cool way that uh, why it's it's interesting to work with um, different formats like a like a VR chess game because you know you have to solve these problems and yeah, we totally. have those ideas you know even really thought about or even just you know what is the interior of what's the floor plan of the yawning portal like things that we wouldn't necessarily have yeah. to map out um, you know in the in the past but now we do and uh, it forces us to solve that and then the just lore and interest and uh, uh, amount of information about Dungeons and Dragons continues to expand with the more people that interact with it, you know? So it, it's, it, you know, just yeah, cool so stuff. 
That is a perfect segue. And, and what's really cool is I don't think anyone, so we've got the trailer queued up. I'm gonna play that in a sec. Sure. I don't think anyone has ever sort of attended a lecture on the concept art, animation, and like lore uh, behind a game and then watch the trailer about it. Yeah. Was, I'm, I'm assuming- we'll give it one. a try. Yeah, yeah. It's literally the, the perfect way to sort of appreciate like the output of this. So this is the trailer, we'll play it. Um, and I don't think anything technically could possibly go wrong. So I'm gonna click the button and it will work. <laughs> you said it, famous last words. Indeed. Are we, are we talking over it? And the Yanni portal so beautiful. And it yeah. always it always warms my heart to see that uh, that trailer. Um, yeah. So so there was actually a great um, question that that popped up in Twitch, and and I will rely on Corey, who is slightly closer to the the Twitch screen, to why, tell us why am I not using uh, this awesome who, pink mouse? Yeah. Uh, to tell us who asked this question, but um, but there was a there was sort of a um, oh yeah exactly. Um, Oh, okay. I can't. Ra 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 yeah, he yeah. said, do we have an idea of what the VR by D&D &D intersection demographic looks like? Which is a great question. And and a question that we actually had to answer <laughs> for, <laughs> for one of our platform partners um, with numbers and math. Uh, so so math. while I can't tell you the very precise uh, answer, even though we do know it, um, the, the, um, the good news is that, yeah, if you look at who... Um, who was buying VR and who had VR when we when we first started doing this, and then uh, and then as the VR market has expanded a little bit, uh, where it has gone, uh, yeah. The, the, if you imagine a a really overlappy looking Venn diagram, um, that the, those people are 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 people, right? They're they're very much people who know what D and D is, mm -hmm. and uh, and and while you're definitely right to say that it seemed like a niche product, it is a niche product because Part, part of why we decided to do this like combat chess game uh, is because we don't want it to be the very last D and D game that we ever do, or the very last thing that we ever do with wizards. And we wanted to make sure that we started out with something that we we could sort of test ourselves with. That we you know how how can we get great mileage out of this brand? How can we? You know, figure out how how to animate these characters in VR. How can we figure out how to build these environments in VR, and to have something that's a little bit less high profile than like, oh my God, it's the giantest D and D game of all time. <laughs> um, so, uh, so uh, is there more down the road? Uh, yes, we we certainly uh, we certainly intend for there to be, um, and our friends at uh, at Wizard certainly intend for there to be. So, um, so we. Yeah, I mean, so while you're absolutely right to say that that is a uh, uh, a niche product, um, the the goal there is, yeah. you know, make all the mistakes early, uh, fix them all before it comes out, <laughs> give you something polished to chew on while we while we get um, get up to speed in a brand new medium. Yeah. Hey, Corey. Um, actually, while we're chatting about this too, can you throw up that cool um, the battle poster? Yeah. Sure. I just want to call this one out to um, actually, Greg, I think at some point you guys are going to throw this up on your free wallpapers as well, because I know uh, we sent the mm -hmm. assets over, but um, it's probably good kind of timing to say, hey, at some point soon, or you guys can grab it off the Experiment 7 website. But um, sure, it's a good, good looking piece of art. Again, just, you know, it was fun to be able to work around, you know, some of the amazing D&D &D stuff. For sure. I love the uh, the unicorns, the nightmares being the the two the yeah. Yeah. Uh, rampant. What is that? That's rampant. Yes, is that what the name of that's is. called? Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, this also really shows, you know, as we were looking at the pieces, you know, the queen is the most powerful piece, you know, on the chessboard. So those were the dragons. You see them. You know, the kings are the most important. You got the storm giants. You know, for things that can kind of you know line up and get rank and file, you can see, you know, 
the high elves and the drow, the knights are the unicorn and the nightmare. You can see the bishop as the deva and the mind flayer, or, you know, the pieces that can like charge or, you know, go straight across the field, the beholder and the werebear. You know, we, we really tried to line them up so you could kind of get this, you know, head to head synergy and kind of look at the pieces and go, yeah, I could see the mind flayer blasting a piece, you know, as a rook all the way across the table. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's the werebear charging across with his huge axe and slamming into something to try and, you know, kind of line that up. And this is just a great one to kind of show off the design of the pieces as well as just the coolness of the D&D, you know, universe we get to work with. Yeah, one of the one of the things that is popping up a lot in the questions and that has popped up a lot whenever we've shown anybody uh, the, the games um, is uh, is how great the art is. Um, so our... Our art director on uh, on this project uh, uh, to start this project and and um, our chief uh, concept artist is a guy that had worked for Wizards before, uh, so he was not um, an accidental pick <laughs> as as the right person, uh, and and so his his work um, is really just incredible, and we also wanted to make minis out of them. Uh, we have a friend who works at a 3D printing facility, uh -huh, uh -huh. and um, and we're going to. I, I tried um, in a in a lackluster way to get some to get my act together. I'm, we can't swear on this, can we? Um, Fuck to, no. To get we don't care. To get we tried to get our shit together to to make um, uh, minis of the pieces for our own for our house D and D campaign at work at the office, but. Um, it was, I'm just bad. I'm bad at, at, <laughs> at um, making that kind of thing happen. So instead, I bought them a bunch of minis for the, and they look w way more like the characters than the chess pieces. Yeah. <laughs> the one, uh, the I'm one sure WizKids uh, appreciates that. <laughs> yes, they do, and and they are WizKids minis, in fact. The one thing <laughs> I love about our character, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things, but I think the the if you go to the the drill down the basic art direction, which is sort of like you know uh, uh the, the stuff that our art director and jeff and and kate over at watsi did a, a fantastic job is you know a big part of chess is pattern recognition and if you look at these pieces they look like the pieces they represent right the palm actually Corey, can you go back to that little skim through thing because sure. i can point that out yeah there you go um yeah there you yeah. go perfect Here example yeah. right if so, you'll uh, notice there's the silhouette yeah of the pieces in the middle of each piece of concept art and you can kind of look at you know the squareness you know the beholder or when you look at like the um, the bishops, which have you know kind of the pointy tops, mm -hmm. for both the mind flayer that, and that the deva. That corset on the bishop and the uh, yeah. the, um, the the uh, the kings with their sort of very regal posture. Yeah. The knights are pretty. Or even kind of like yeah. the battle skirts on the pawns, because you yeah. know the pawns always have the bottom part that flares out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the knights obviously. Well, there are horses. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so we're we're getting close to the end of this little thing, and oh, that's, um, that's a drag. This I know, uh, but but I went by uh, fast. <laughs> yeah, I know. So we have a couple little things to share. We have some some new screenshots, which uh, just got approved by you guys. So I wanted to step through those. Click. Um, and again, I'm going to click it. 